millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am, but Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. Nerdwallet finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. You want to change your life. You need a budget. Not a boring, you can't do this and you can't have that type of budget that feels like life is about taking things away. But as our guest Allison Baggerly believes, you need an inspired budget. A budget that is about more than just putting numbers on a piece of paper. It's an access pass to your life, the one you want to live. You're listening to Millennial Money with award-winning money expert and serial entrepreneur, Shauna Compton Game, where we flip the script on the old school approach to everything your parents never taught you about money. Each week, Shauna creates a safe space by talking with special guests from around the world about money wellness, entrepreneurship, traveling like a boss, and what makes millennials tick. Unique stories, trailblazing perspectives, tips, tricks, and everything there is to know about money. Find it all here as you uncover your money story and unlock the life you want to live. Pretty cool, right? Here's Shauna, money expert, Indiana Hoosier, and burger aficionado. Allison and her husband's story is one that you hear a lot. You've probably heard this a lot on the show. Maybe it's a lot like yours. They were both teachers, not making a ton of money, but in over $100,000 of debt and just dreading water. It took five years to pay off the debt, but in that time, Allison learned some serious budgeting skills because she had to. She also learned the importance of making a budget that works for you, not against you, and became so passionate about budgeting that even her family was like, okay, you need to find someone else to talk about budgeting because we don't want to hear it anymore. So she said, okay, fine, became a blogger, an influencer, speaker, and the founder of Inspired Budget. Allison sharing her journey and some of her favorite budgeting tips and mistakes in this episode. So before we dive into the episode, I have to share a little something that we have in common. I just learned that we have another something in common before we hit the record button. We both, you live in Houston. Mm-hmm. I used to live in Houston. We shared some stories of cockroaches and horrid <laughs> humidity. <laughs> but we have another thing in common. You said you've been skydiving twice but <gasps> can't hold handle roller coasters. And I, I, I am the exact same way. I'm so happy I met somebody that I can't do roller coasters but has willingly jumped out of an airplane. Okay. It is so much easier to jump out of an airplane. Everyone is so shocked. I'm like, no, you just go. And it's not right. like this. I don't know. I mean, I guess like it, it bothers your stomach a little bit, but it's just so incredible that you can't even think about that. Whereas roller coasters, I get so, so nauseous and I'm just like, nope, not for me. Not going to do it. Uh, and yeah, did you do solo or tandem? Skydiving? Oh, I did tandem. I used to before I had children. I was like, I want to you know, get my license and do solo skydiving and then having kids changes so much. Um, plus it's really expensive. So, so I did tandem twice. The first time we did a front flip out of the plane. And the second time we did a back flip out of the plane. Oh my gosh. Well, I did solo, which was (gasps) nuts in college. And I only did it because it was supposed to be a big group of us going and all the girls backed out. Oh, and so I no. was like, I am not going to be the girl that backs out of this, you know. But That's when you're right. in, 
when you're in the airplane and they tell you like, okay, we're going to kill the engine. You're going to go hang off the wing uh-huh. and you're going to let go. I'm like, <gasps> I'm going to do what? Yes. <laughs> See, the good thing about skydiving tandem is they do that. They kill the engine. You sit outside and you're like literally out because the person's behind you and you have no choice. They let go. You don't have to make the choice to let go. You're just already strapped on and they just do it for you. Yeah, that's great. You don't even have to, you don't have to have a choice. And are you, Mm -hmm. are you a natural risk taker? Are you a little bit more of a conservative person? Like where does your personality fall? I'm a natural risk taker. I love doing risky things. Um, I love like, I really want to bungee jump, which sounds crazy that I don't like roller coasters, but I'm willing to (laughs) bungee jump. Um, you know, just anything where I can be out doing something that is going to be a thrill. I, I want to do it. I love that. I think that's a great way to embrace life. And I'm Mm -hmm. all about the bumper sticker of I don't do roller coasters. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. I'm right there with you. I'm in the I'm in the like kitty land at any theme park. Like let just put me on the easy little kitty ride and I am just happy. Mm -hmm. Me too. Well, it's nice also to meet somebody who is is so passionate about budgeting. It's something that I obviously talk about a lot on this podcast and has talked a lot about changing the rules around budgeting and and that you need to make it your own and that it doesn't have to be this dry, boring task. It really is this entry point to getting you to the life you want to live. But you say that your journey started with budgeting about nine years ago and most people run from budgeting, but you really embraced it. So I'm curious, what do you think is so powerful about budgeting? Like, how did this come into your life, into your world? Well, we were really forced into budgeting, I feel like, out of fear. So for so long, I was too scared to actually look at my finances, total up my debt. I really was just living paycheck to paycheck and just hoping that I would have enough money to last until the end of the month. And if I didn't, I would, you know, transfer over $50 from my really small savings account. But when I started budgeting, I no longer had the fear that I had been experiencing for so many years. I felt more in control for the first time ever, even though my finances were telling me, Allison, you have lost control of everything. And I was looking at it and it was scary. I felt more in control. And we actually got into budgeting because we became pregnant and couldn't afford daycare payments. Um, We realized that we didn't have the $800 a month left over to to send our, you know, unborn child to daycare one day. Which is just crazy, by the mm-hmm. way. The cost of daycare is just, I know. it blows my mind. <laughs> I know. And it's so many people you delay having children because of it. Um, having two kids in daycare, it was over $1,500 a month for us. It was, it was difficult. And, but budgeting made it possible. And when you talk about putting it, put put yourself more in a a state of of control, was it just that you had an awareness now of what was going on with your money or how did that shift actually happen for you? So for us, not only did I feel like I was aware, but I also felt like I had the knowledge, the tools um, and the budget to allow me to make a plan and reach goals. So it's one thing to just be aware of your finances. You know, people who check their bank statement every day might be aware of their finances. People who have their bills on auto draft are aware. But whenever you write a budget, it's a it's a plan, it is a tool to help you reach goals that maybe seem impossible. Hmm. Yeah, I like that. And I'm curious because you you did this journey with your husband and so many people have questions about money and budgeting process Mm -hmm. with a partner or spouse. Did you have an experience where your husband was a willing participant in this or what was your journey as, as partners together like figuring this out? So we were very lucky in the fact that as soon as we got married, we got pregnant on our honeymoon. <laughs> so, nice, yes, we, nice. I know. So we we dated and we were engaged and we never once had a conversation about money. And you, nothing at least in depth. Maybe just like, oh, you have a savings account? Cool. I have a small savings account too. We're both teachers. And we never had these deep conversations. It was always very shallow. Then we got married and we got pregnant. And that's one of our deep conversations had to start happening. And it was all because of the fear of not being able to provide. Thankfully, that 
fear was enough of a reason for both of us to be on board. Naturally, I'm a spender and he's a saver. So there were very tough conversations along the way where I felt very deprived or I had to think through the process of impulse spending to keep myself from you know, making choices that would derail us from our goals. But luckily, we both started learning at the same time. So it never felt like I was educating him and teaching him my way. And it wasn't the opposite where he was trying to say, okay, well, I've been doing finances for a while. I'm in control. Here's how you need to do it, Allison. It was a process where we learn and grew together. That's fantastic. I think mm-hmm. I that's always amazing when that happens. You know, what sort of advice would you give to someone who's maybe in the opposite situation where they don't have someone so willing? I mean, is is there mm-hmm. a way to to come together or should one person be the point person? Like what sort of advice mm-hmm. would you give in that situation? Definitely. I know our situation is very unique. Most people have, you know, one person's more on board than the other. Sometimes you have someone who doesn't want anything to do with the budget or the finances. They just want to be blind to it all. And then you have a spouse that is like, no, please, we need to do something. So what I would say is come to the table judgment free, willing to give grace, because I think so often We come to the table to talk about finances very emotional. And when you're emotional about something or you become angry, you start saying things that you might not mean or you might mean them, but you say it in a way that's unkind. So come to the table without the emotions and more with the facts. Here's how much debt we have. You know, what is it that you want to do in the future, five years down the line, one year down the line? five years down the line, 10 years down the line, where do you want to be? Because right now, you know, we're having trouble making ends meet, but there's a solution where if we budget and work to pay off debt, that it doesn't have to be like this. And I think that when you present the facts and sometimes you remove the emotions from it, it's easier for your spouse or your partner to digest that information. I'm a big fan of that. If you can take the emotion out, it it mm-hmm. really helps you. I mean, so many different scenarios, like when you're trying to buy a house, take the emotion out, yes. which is a lot uh, easier said than done. But but yes. I definitely think if you can treat money that way, that's when you can start seeing the opportunity of change. And I know that budgeting for you guys led to paying off a massive amount of debt. And uh, And I'm sure I want you to share that story and then also piggyback it with, I'm sure a lot of people maybe do budget and maybe they are in debt, but they're not seeing anything happen. So like, what was the trick that ended up leading to this massive debt payoff for you guys? So we basically had over $111,000 worth of debt and we were on two teacher salaries. So when we first got married and started working, we were making combined about $80,000, maybe a little bit more, maybe $85,000. And, you know, after taxes and insurance, that's not a lot of money take home pay when you're paying for daycare. And our minimum monthly debt payments were more than our mortgage. Our minimum debt payments were over $1,400 a month. And that was a lot to stomach. The idea of us taking almost five years when we first sat down and thought, how long will this actually take us? The idea of it lasting five years felt like an eternity. And that almost made me want to stop, to be honest. I almost wanted to be like, no, you know what? Five years, that's way too long. I would rather just be slightly uncomfortable for the rest of my life than incredibly uncomfortable for five years. But one thing that I've learned is that we all have seasons in our life. We all have seasons of sacrifice, and then we have seasons of abundance as well. And so we were dedicated to live in a season of sacrifice for that period of time so that the remainder of our life could be a season of abundance. And we did things to sacrifice, you know, where we didn't take these massive, fabulous vacations. We didn't enjoy conveniences such as, you know, cable. We got rid of cable before cable was like cool to get rid of. Like (laughs) we, we got rid of cable when people were like, what are those two rabbit ear antennas on your roof? And we're like, that's how we watch TV. Right. (laughs) 
You're like, so, it will become popular in a few years. I yes, promise. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We were able to sacrifice for that time, knowing that there was that season of, of abundance, even though it was hard to see, even though it felt impossible, even though it felt like an eternity away, we always kept our eye on that season of abundance, which is hard to do. When you have a lot of debt, looking past that debt can feel impossible. So by making all of these tweaks and changes, taking away some things for Mm -hmm. your spending, then my guess is then you would automatically send those amounts towards your your debt payoff strategy, right? Yes. So one of our biggest things was when we were both teachers, which I'm no longer teaching, but when we were both teachers, we both got paid once a month. So we would get paid, pay all of our bills, pull out any money we needed in cash for spending or leave some money in our you know, checking account for gas and things that would come up. And then we would immediately make our debt payments. Now we had money in savings just in case something crazy happened, but we would make our debt payments. We would budget it out. So we basically paid our debt right away and it forced us to live on less the rest of the month. There's that season of sacrifice, that season of being uncomfortable. We didn't wait until the end of the month to just say, let's see how much money we have left. We prioritized our goals by doing that. And there were times when it was very uncomfortable. There were times we got down to $2 in our checking account. And and there were times that we needed to transfer money from savings. But when we were able to prioritize you know, our savings and our debt payoff at the very beginning of every single month, we were forced to live within our budget of what we had set. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news Well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps, but I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC. It's Tuesday, and we've got another Ask Shauna, and this one comes from an anonymous listener. Hi, Shauna. I'm a recent listener, about three months, but since I started tuning in, I've been much better at budgeting and getting my debt under control. I went from no budget to a budget. Just wanted to thank you for all the free professional advice. I'm writing because an estate of $15,000 is coming my way. The most I've ever had in my bank account at once is 2 k Hopefully a new job in the works will change that very soon. 
I know I want to pay it off about 5k in credit card debt to clear it entirely. I don't know what to do with the rest of the inheritance. There are also student loans, about 58000 but I don't want to use all my money just to make a dent in that. I don't know how to invest, and I'm not really stock savvy. Some close family is suggesting investing in a retirement bond and others advising against it. I don't want this opportunity to go to waste, and I'd really appreciate your opinion. Well, Anonymous, yes, I have had this question in lots of different ways, and it's always that like mixed bag blessing. You are so thrilled to come into money. Of course, you don't want it to have to come in inheritance, so fully understand what I'm saying here. But that's also met with a million different decisions of what to do with this money. So I'll start off by saying that there aren't any ways you can go wrong here, except if maybe like you just decided to spend it all on something that doesn't give you any type of positive reward. So example, I had somebody once ask me if it was a good idea to spend their inheritance to buy lottery tickets for a better chance to win the lottery. Okay, I I see your logic here, <laughs> but let's look at the lotto odds. They're they're not so great. So I I gently advised that that was probably not the best idea, but I can give you all my ideas, all my thoughts on this and it's really going to come down to you and what you think is best for you. If you feel like blowing the money on some lottery excursion or some fancy trip, maybe you want to ride camels in Egypt, then that is fully your choice as long as you think through all your alternatives and just feel really comfortable that the decision you're making is a good decision. So I think your idea of getting rid of the high interest credit card debt is a fantastic one. So let's knock that out and get rid of that 5K. Now you've got 10K to play with. So here are some thoughts. First, what would it take to build up your emergency fund to at least one to three months worth of your fixed expenses? I would take some time to shore that up to make sure you just have a nice pad for yourself in case you get laid off from your job or something happens with your health. I mean, there are a million different things, but just making sure that you have at least one month will really, I think, um, it actually, it just makes me feel better about your situation. So it may not make you feel one way or another, but hopefully it makes you feel a little uh, less stressed. Uh, number two is, do you currently contribute to a 401k or a Roth or IRA? If not, you may consider opening up maybe a Roth or an IRA right now when you're in job transition or contributing to your 401k if you have access to one. So if you're looking at Roth or IRA, I would check out companies like Robinhood, Elvest, or Betterment. Each of them has their own pluses or minuses, so I'm not going to recommend one over the other, but they can help you construct an investment portfolio that is based on your needs and your risk tolerance, not your family's, not your friends, yours. That's what's really important. So this is a great uh, place to start building up some wealth and, and getting your money just growing in a positive, hopefully positive direction that is going to grow more than a savings account or a bank account. And that's what we want. We need some positive lift to your money. Another good idea would just be hire a certified financial planner for an hour of their time to pick their brain. The beauty of this is that they get to see the entire situation. And I'm only looking at this little snapshot of what you told me. But when you hire a CFP, they're looking at everything. So they'd be able to give you more guidance And a great place to start if you don't have access or you don't know anyone who is a financial planner, go over to xyplanningnetwork.com and you can search for a financial planner in your area. They have a ton of young uh, virtual planners, like great people. So I would head over to there. So hopefully this has given you a little bit of guidance. Like I said, you really can't go wrong in this situation. I mean, look, even if you blew your money on lottery tickets, eh. What if you win, right? <laughs> the joke's on me then. You can't go wrong. Just make sure that you you really think this out and make sure that you give yourself a little bit of like a cash cushion so that you have that there for any emergencies. So we cover and ask Shauna every Tuesday and 
I want to answer your question. There is no such thing as a bad question. And you can even tell me just like this person to keep your name anonymous. We are a community here, so your question helps everyone. So ask away. Head on over to the link in the show notes or jump over to our podcast hub, mmoneypodcast.com, and you'll find the Ask Shauna area right there on the homepage. Curious, like how long did it take before you started to see some progress enough so that you were like, okay, this is actually working? You know, it was so long ago, I cannot remember, maybe a couple of months before we paid off just a really small loan. Um, My last student loan that I paid off, it was one that I couldn't even pay it online. I had to mail in a check every single month with a little coupon, like a coupon thing, to this bank, to the small bank. And when I when I mailed in my last check, I put in a letter that said, see you later. I'm done with student loans. Yeah. And they wrote me back. <laughs> they wrote me back and said, congratulations with my payoff notes. Like a person hand wrote me back. I thought that was so cool. And when you can, you know, those types of very small minuscule moments would keep us motivated during the tough times. And what do you think are some of the mistakes that people make with their budget? Because I think a lot of us just maybe even by osmosis think we have to do budgeting Mm -hmm. one specific way. Yes. And that's not true. You know, what are some of the, what are some of the mistakes that you see people make? Well, I think one of the biggest mistakes is that people don't know their spending habits and instead they are trying to make a budget for what they wish their spending habits would be. So for instance, I'm a spender. I love going to Target. I love spending money. In in my heart of hearts, I wish I didn't love spending money. You know, like if I were to write a perfect budget, it would be me having no spending money. And that's what we did at first. But we were writing a budget for someone else's money habits, not my own. And so what ended up happening was I overspent naturally because that's like, (laughs) surprise, surprise. (laughs) Um, I overspent and then felt shame and guilt. And after three months of doing this, I was like, why am I feeling shame and guilt for this? I know I like to spend money. I know I need to include Allison's spending money in our budget because when I can create that boundary, when I give myself that allowance and that boundary, I don't feel bad about spending and yet we still get closer to our goals. So if you like to go out to eat, give yourself a restaurant budget. If you like to go out to eat a lot, add $100 more to it. Don't deny yourself your money habits and try to create a budget for this ideal person with perfect money habits because it doesn't exist. And if it's not going to match you, then it's not going to work. And I think that's such a good point because there is, in, in any time we're talking about money, there is this air of perfectionism, I find, mm-hmm. that people feel like, you have to be perfect. You have to make all the perfect steps, do all the perfect things. And that you do like, like when you're doing a budget, like somehow that means if, if you know you're a spender, you have to just cut all that out. And it's, it's Mm -hmm. literally like trying to change your entire personality. Exactly. And it's hard to do. And then when you end up spending money, then you do, you feel the shame and guilt and you feel I'm not perfect. I can't do this. And then it goes into this horrible cycle. Well, then you're like, why, why do I even do budgeting? Cause I feel terrible. And I think if we could change that narrative. So I think what you're talking about is like how to make it flexible for you and fit for you, but still be mindful of what you're spending, but also the goal you're trying to get to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because who wants to budget when it makes them feel terrible? No one. Who wants to budget when it makes you feel awful about yourself afterwards? And, you know, no one's perfect. You can't live up to that. But yes, changing the way you budget so that way it's realistic, that way it fits your life, and you're still allowing room for the goals that you have set, whether those goals are to pay off debt, save for a vacation, buy a new car, I don't know, spend a hundred dollars on Halloween decorations. I don't care. We all have these. <laughs> goals that we have. And when you write a budget, you can actually prioritize those goals. It's when we just spend aimlessly and without purpose that we're actually putting our goals and dreams on the back burner. Mm, Yeah. Yeah. And is there, 
is there a system or an app or is, is there a specific way that you talk to people about budgeting or is it more about finding what what works for you, what motivates you? Like, how do you find that right system, I guess, if you will. Mm -hmm. So I believe that, you know, everyone is different and everyone needs to find their unique way of budgeting. For me, it's paper and pencil. I literally, I always do it in pencil in case I mess up. I have my eraser. (laughs) I sit down and I write it all out in pencil. I'm able to personally see things better, understand things better when I write it out. Whereas my husband, he is more inclined to want to do something like on Excel or an app but he he goes along with me wanting to write everything out on pencil. I keep it on the fridge. I think ultimately it's finding something that's going to work for you. If it is an app and the app is confusing to you and you've used it for three months and you're still not happy with it, don't give up on budgeting. Find a different tool. If you use paper and pencil and you hate writing, I have a friend who hates writing. Like the idea of even writing on a post-it note drives him crazy. Don't use paper and pencil to write a budget. But for me personally, it's paper and pencil using a calendar to help me organize myself and my budget, my bills, everything, and being able to find something, a tool, a method that is consistent where I understand completely my budget. I like that. I mean, there's definitely like scientific studies around handwriting Mm -hmm. something out that there's, there's like a brain, there's a brain, mind, soul, however you want to flow (laughs) it. Like there's a whole connection that happens there when you physically write something out. It's like it gets, Mm -hmm. it gets hardwired then in you. And, and somehow I have found that handwriting things out, even though my handwriting isn't fantastic, um, mm-hmm. that handwriting out actually motivates me more than typing it or using an app. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I mean, that's that's obviously the scientific side point, but you have to figure out, I think, what works for you. And I think that's great that you that you inspire people to find that that flexibility. I mean, in the at the end of the day, if if you're using a system that you you hate, you're not going to use it. Right. Exactly. (laughs) It's just another excuse not to budget. So exactly. And for me, when it comes to tracking my expenses, I don't handwrite everything out. I use a software program and I've used it for 10 years. So it's okay to mix the way you do things. It's okay to write a budget one way, but then track your expenses another way. You don't have to be stuck in a certain way that someone says that you should be budgeting or you should be tracking your expenses. You can find what works for you. And I wonder if you could speak about how did your budget change from the season of Mm -hmm. sacrifice into the season of, okay, we've paid everything off. Now we need to make shifts. Like how did you make those shifts with your budget? So maybe you didn't go completely into spending mode or mm-hmm. you know, how do you how do you manage that weird time in between there when you're obviously very happy you pay things off but now you're in a new season right our family personally went a little crazy for about three months after we paid off debt I yes. I almost feel like what are we doing I felt so out of control with my money you see We were paying off debt and living in that season of sacrifice for four and a half years, which, like I said, sounds like a long time, but in in the long span of my life is just, it's just a season. It's just a blip of time. But in those four and a half years, you do develop habits. You develop this state of being comfortable. I used to think once we pay off debt, we are, I'm never budgeting again. We're going to have everything that we want. It's going to be wonderful. But I became so comfortable with how we were living. Now, when we did pay off debt, we kind of went crazy for about three months. We never went back into debt for, during that three months, but we were just a, a lot more lenient with our spending. We were not tracking our money. It was almost just like this exhale after such a long journey. And after three months, I was like, whoa, 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 we've got to <laughs> rein it in. You know, this is, we didn't do all of this work to then turn around and spend the $2,000 a month we were sending to debt to just who knows what, like mostly food. You don't even have anything to show for it. <laughs> so, so that's when we set new goals. You know, that's when we set up our Roth IRA. We set up a college fund for our kids. We set up savings goals. I knew that my husband and I wanted to take a big trip 
you know, the two of us, no kids allowed to celebrate our success. We had that savings goal set up and it became a point of figuring out the balance for us between saving money and then living a life we love. So for instance, you know, we love to take small trips, especially like camping trips and things like that. We like to buy new camping gear. I don't want to send all my money to savings the way I was sending it to debt and not be able to experience some of that family fun. So we revamped our budget to where we did have some family fun money and ways to spend on things we love, but we were still able to save money in the process. I like that. It's all about balance. It's Mm -hmm. all about balance. And you're right. There are times when you're just in the paying off mode or the saving mode, Mm -hmm. and then it's all about finding balance from then on. And one thing I love is that you you are really passionate about working with uh, women and their money yes. on inspired budget. And I'm curious, are there are there ways you see women struggle with their money or budgeting that that's kind of unique to us? Is is there any differences that you see that pop up? I feel like women have a lot of shame and guilt around money, um, and I feel like they they take on a lot of the burden. I feel like women tend to own the money problems, even in a marriage, which is sad because you're in a marriage. I mean, it's 50-50. And it can just be incredibly overwhelming. It's so overwhelming that it makes you just not want to talk about it, deal with it, fix it. And it causes, you know, almost like adverse reactions. People have so much shame and guilt about money, and then it can even lead to impulse spending. It can lead to overeating. It can lead to finding contentment in other ways. And so I feel like with women, we have so much more work just as emotional people or more emotional people. We have so much more work to do because money is emotional, because it is difficult to remove the emotions from money. Dealing with your finances isn't just math. It's math and it's emotions. It's math and finding balance in your life. It's math and learning how to run a family on a budget. So I feel like overall, it it just appears harder. <laughs> it probably is harder, Um but it doesn't have to be difficult. And there are tips, there are tricks, there are ways to make it easier and even, dare dare I say, fun (laughs) when it comes to managing money and writing a budget and your finances. I love the word fun. People look at me Uh a little cross-eyed when I said, you can have fun with your money. (laughs) I know. (laughs) So at what point did you decide then to start Inspired Budget and really like take on this mission of of teaching people about budgeting? Well, you know, we were working on our finances or working on paying off debt. I was a teacher full time and that was just my passion. Talking about writing a budget. I used to write my budget two weeks in advance because we only got paid once a month. So I would only, I only had the privilege of writing a budget once a month and I would write budgets for fun just to be like, oh, maybe this is what our budget will look like. (laughs) And almost like a rough draft budget, a preview, if you will. And it was just everything I wanted to talk about. I I probably made so many of my colleagues uncomfortable by talking about finances in the teacher's lounge at our school <laughs> because it was just on my mind. And we paid off debt and I thought, okay, well, this is done. I don't need to talk about this anymore. But I kept coming back to it. I kept talking about it. And one day we were visiting family at Easter time and my cousin-in-law was talking about, you know, paying off debt or budgeting or who knows something about money. And my cousin-in-law said, Allison, enough. Like, we're done hearing about this. And I was like, what? Excuse me? No one ever tells me to be quiet. They just stop talking and just hope I stop. (laughs) And she said, every time we get together, you talk about this. Like, we're done. We've heard your story. We understand. You've gotten your point across. You need to take this to a bigger group of people. Like, you need to turn this into a business because you're clearly passionate about it. And two weeks later, Inspire Budget was born. My mom and I and my husband stayed up until two o'clock in the morning coming up with the name and the idea of what I would be doing. And uh, two years later, I was able to leave my full-time teaching job and work on Inspire Budget full-time. 
I love that. That's such a great story. I love that your family's <laughs> like, all right, we, yeah, we've heard it. Like, please find a new audience here. <laughs> I know. Yes, because it's like I was pushing it on so many people and I see that now and I, I kind of feel bad, but I'm kind of like, well, I mean, <laughs> I had a passion, you know. <laughs> I was pushing it on so many people who weren't necessarily ready or willing to listen. And, you know, my cousin-in-law, Janet, helped me understand I need to find people that are ready and willing to listen because I can have a bigger impact that way. I, I'm curious. I want to leave everybody with with some either action step or just something to sink down in them about budgeting. You know, what is something that you think – we could do today to help us with budgeting, whether it's a mindset piece or it's a like actual action step. What, what's something that you could direct us to do? I would say face your money truth, even if it's scary. And what that looks like is opening up your bank account, getting an idea of how much money you have in your checking, your savings, how much debt you have, but then also facing your money truth in terms of how you want to move forward with your money, how you want to spend your money in the future, what goals you have, and also your spending habits. Because so often, Many people fail at budgeting because they are writing a budget for someone who is nothing like them. And when you face your money truth and you face your money spending habits, you can actually write a budget and spend money the way you spend money and it can actually work. So our task, find our money truth. That's my mission this week and I hope it's yours too. If you want to learn more about Allison, you can follow her on Instagram at Inspired Budget or go to inspiredbudget.com. You can also check out her podcast with Chris Browning called This is Awkward. I love this, where they talk about awkward money situations and how to navigate your way through them. Thanks for tuning in. And I hope you were inspired to share this episode with a friend or family member today. Just a reminder, you can find all the links in the show notes. Until next time, I wish you the best Millennial Money Day. Hey, you. Yes, you. Before you go, we want to say thanks for listening to this episode of Millennial Money. For all the links, tags, and ads you've heard on today's episode, check out the show notes or go to mmoneypodcast.com, where you'll find more episodes to share with your friends. While you're at it, leave us a review and make sure to subscribe wherever you listen so you don't miss out on all the money tips and tricks that will take you from a millennial regular to a millennial money expert. See you back here in a few days with a fresh new episode. Whatever you're saving up for, a CD from Sandy Spring Bank lets you grow your savings at a guaranteed rate. Right now, earn interest at 4.5% APY on an 8-month CD special or 4.25% APY on a 14-month CD special. Learn more at sandyspringbank.com slash CD specials. Minimum opening deposit to earn the annual percentage yield is $500 for the 8-month CD special and $2,500 for the 14-month CD special. Member FDIC.